Good morning, y'all. Happy Thursday and welcome on in to today's Freight Waves Now Community Spotlight. I'm Kaylee Nix here with the one and only Thomas Wasson, joining us to talk about his community loaded and rolling. Thomas, before we get into our conversation today, the Great Freight Wars, I want to talk a little bit about your appearance on Grace Sharkey's community, or not <laughs> Grace Sharkey, with Grace Sharkey on Mary O'Connell's community this week. You guys got there together with Grace Sharkey to talk all about non-competes. And this episode was an episode full of spicy takes. I got to know, how was it being on Mary's show? It's always fun. Always fun to get to come on. It's fun getting to just drop some spice. And I'm telling you, we were we were kicking it up a notch. It was like the Emerald Agassi where you just yelled bam a few times. Uh, you know, you got to watch it. But I highlight the spiciest take I felt like was, uh, you know, you're using non-competes to hide your crappy business. I would agree that that is quite the spicy take, but I think that it's a correct one and one that we will see exposed more and more and more as this lawsuit continues to play out. Let's keep the spice rolling, moving on to today's topic for Loaded and Rolling, talking all about the freight wars. And we're going to insert a word in here, the freight rate wars. Q1 earnings coming out from a lot of our big time transportation providers. Everybody's saying bid season was more competitive than they thought. Why the competition around rates? Well, it's kind of like... Uh... We're talking about instead of the spicy takes, the spice must flow today. Now, this time it's coming for contracted rates. Of the, you know, kicking it off, JB Hunt, Knight Swift, two big things they noted was that the softness, surprising amount of not only softness in the market, but competition for bids. So that's kind of the first part of this three act play here uh, as we've been watching these earnings trickle out over the past few weeks. The second part was looking at Heartland, normally a great operator, great OR, trying to digest recent acquisitions. Also had some uh, things talking about not relying on brokered freight, moving unprofitable lanes, looking at the end, refusing to lower freight rates. So we're starting to see an undercurrent here because you'll notice that as, as the time moves on, executives will try to talk about things they can highlight. And then finally, my favorite was Martin, M-A-R-T-E-N. That's right, folks. Spelled it wrong on LinkedIn with an I. Don't do that. It'll, uh, it'll get more engagement, so maybe do that. I will recommend it. They had uh, talked about how kind of one-upping everybody else, they said, we have not agreed to rate reductions since last August. And so what we are seeing here is this gamut of where my personal take, all gloves are off. I need freight. All the carriers talk about, you know, this uh, gentlemanly conduct. But right now it's getting a little bit desperate because we are, especially as the freight recession is is in the la last tail end of this current cycle, it's starting to get a little antsy. So this is, of course, something that is really almost kind of industry moving, right? When you see these big time transfer transportation providers, Heartland, J.B. Hunt, um, Martin, as you mentioned, start to make these, these notes that they're not making concessions and they're really pushing on their shippers for these rates. That means that you're going to see the other guys, maybe the mid, mid to smaller size guys say, oh, we got to do that too. Like if the big guys are doing it, that means that we can do it. Maybe we don't have as much push power, but we can do it too. Is that what's going to end up having to trickle down? And is this how we start to see the kind of pendulum swing back in the carrier's favor, starting with the big ones and it trickles down? Correct. This is the equivalent of the uh, trucking companies blinking SOS uh, or saying I'm being tortured by shippers during their earnings calls. This is signaling. Now, uh, the reason we hear them mention it, because we haven't really heard this before. So this is an important signal, which is saying to shippers very passively, because remember, executives speak in whispers, but the weight of the words makes ripples. Uh, that's saying that we are getting to the point where this is getting a little crazy. And if you don't stop doing this when the market turns, I'm coming for you first. Now, this provides cover and shade for other carriers to say, oh, yeah, did you hear of uh, the other executives talked about this? This is giving the narrative is now changing towards as we're approaching Q2 and Q3 bids is that we've hit this inflection point. Craig talked about it in like finance terms when he, he wrote an article a week ago talking about we're reaching an inflection point to where enough is enough to uh, in terms of how far can this sustain. So. We've been seeing this for six months in spot market. It's been kind of a pain. It's been rough. But contract markets take longer to feel this. And so if there ever was a point where the springboard for things to slowly, hopefully start getting better, these are some of the words that we're hearing from executives. So I do think that's the key. Take these, take these words in context in terms of signaling uh, intentions as we're moving forwards, because otherwise 
uh, it could get a little bit more heated in terms of further losses, which we're still hearing year over year for a lot of executives. These executives reporting their earnings, of course, talk about their spend and what that looks like for the first quarter. And this leads directly into our second topic for today, talking about March trailer orders falling on less CapEx and you know, companies able to spend on those trailer orders. What does this look like from a big perspective? We know that a lot of the trailer manufacturers on the opposite side were saying, hey, we're still still continuing to work through a COVID backlog. They're getting almost getting it done. But now they are starting to have to rely on those new build orders coming back in. What's happening if people are now pulling back on the orders? Well, there's three things. The first part was we're looking at, obviously, there's higher costs, less money to spend, therefore less capital expenditure. You know, we talked about year over year declines with uh, operating income and net income for these carriers. It means they don't have as much money to spend on their equipment. The second thing is from ACT research, the fascinating part of March is that not all declines were equal. So dry van was down in the past month nearly a third at 28%. Open deck was getting close to a half flatbed down 40%. But reefer was up 6%. So let's we're thinking about this market. One of the things I've been talking about is uh, the continued de declines in reefer tender rejection rates and softening of spot rates. Well, looking at the equipment from the past month, there's a lot of information showing that more capacity has come in. More people are buying reefer units or refurbishing them or, you know, re-upping on their supplies. So we are starting to see this very interesting segment where moving into produce season, one thing to watch, will reefer madness continue or will it be kind of, you know, dead, so to speak? The second thing, EPA ruling, trucks will get more expensive beginning in like model year 2027, I believe, moving through 32. That means we have less money to spend on trailers. That's another thing they're talking about. So difficult decisions on how to spend less money, with more expensive equipment. These are the things we're going to watch. There is some interesting highlights and jockeying. Some people are debating about tractor and trailer orders. Uh, are people going to buy more before 2027? Will we see the next two years get crazy? Or are people going to wait? It's in the air right now, but it's, it's, it's worth watching. These are the dogs not barking in terms of how are we trying to make sense of this market. We have to look at from other angles uh, it, while looking at the main factor, which is rates still are rough. So Thomas, let's talk about your episode of Loaded and Rolling that aired this week on our last Tuesday. You had your very special guests from Nikola. Thank you to their April sponsorship. And they came in to close out the last show of the month. Talk a little bit about that episode. It was a fun episode talking about uh, Hyla and what they're working on in the infrastructure space, especially in terms of uh, the the hydrogen and the infrastructure involved. It's, it's really cool because we are still in this neck and neck race in terms of like the battery electric. Is it going to be natural gas? Is it going to be hydrogen? Where are we going to go with all of this? And so the big thing is California is still key, especially as states are incentivizing to lead the way. Canada is a close second from our conversation. Canada has been making some moves, but uh, looking at places like Lo uh, Los Angeles, a lot of people give California a hard time, but the LA basin does have some problems in terms of climate and emissions, uh, smog. So, they, you know, it's it's one of those things where, yes, there is a vested interest because some of the political politics in California want more green energy. But there's also a very pragmatic approach because if there's fewer uh, emissions from these tractors, especially around areas of the ports, because you got to imagine LA is kind of landlocked in terms of you have the mountains behind it. Uh, and then you have the Inland Empire. There are there are very interesting things where we will see that go first. And then as this process is defined, and as the technology matures and costs eventually go down, it will go nationwide. But right now we are in the very early fa phases. So Nikola is positioning themselves to take advantage of it. We always got to remember that despite the fact that a lot of companies are making the vehicles, Nikola included, Nikola has also decided, well, I'm going to actually start getting ahead by making the infrastructure. Because if the infrastructure is there, they will come. So that's the key thing to watch. We're watching the, it's almost like a tortoise and the hare. The hare right now is all the cool vehicles and the new models being released and the better ranges. But the tortoise, more important one in this conversation, is going to be that infrastructure build. That's what Hila is working on. Really cool stuff to watch. And this is going to take two or three years. That's one of the challenges. We can't just pop open a station. They have the mobile units, but they're thinking ahead and it's building a foundation. So just like AI and machine learning, you build the foundation and you're finally reaping the benefits, infrastructure matters. Don't sleep on it. Keep an eye on it. 
It's like the chicken and the egg, except in this case, they come together because you got your chicken from Tractor Supply and then you bought your eggs from Publix and just put them in the coop. Thomas, thank you for joining us here this morning. Great to have you as always, and we will catch you next week for your next Loaded and Rolling.